I'm Absalon NYC uh, co-producer and fellow Greg Taubman. I'm here tonight to tell you the story of the origin of modern horror spectacle and of its muse, Paula Maxa. So before we dive in, just a brief content warning. There's going to be some uh, simulated violence, gender-based violence, and sexual assault. So if none of that is your vibe, please take the next five minutes to go ahead and refresh your drink. I won't miss you. It'll be fine. Um, cool. All right, now that we're among perverts and sadists, I mean, friends, let's dive in. It's Paris, 1897, and Oscar Metinier, a playwright and police officer, has just purchased the smallest theater in Paris, a former chapel in the rough and tumble neighborhood of Pegas. Because of his beat, his job was to spend the final moments with prisoners who were condemned to die. Oscar is interested in telling the stories of common folk, not the nobility and royalty who normally took up the stage. In that spirit, he names the theater after this puppet, Guignol, a Punch and Judy character who represents the concerns of the working class. And so is born Le Grand Guignol. And for a while, it does exactly what Oscar hopes for, telling the stories of prostitutes, criminals, con artists, and street urchins. Though frequently subjected to censorship because of its content, the Grand Guignol proved to be a huge success, cramming its 293-seat capacity almost nightly. In 1898, Metinier was succeeded by Max Maury, who brought a less, shall we say, humanistic approach to his predecessor. Maury's obsession was violence, graphic, naturalistic violence. He himself claimed to measure the success of his plays by the number of people who fainted, and is even said to have hired doctors to be on call to help stricken audience members, though perhaps that was just good publicity. Le Grand Guignol also pioneered special effects such as fake knives, blood squids, and even pumps to mimic arterial spurting. Maori was also drawn to madness. Unlike the vampires, demons, and monsters that populated gothic horror novels, the Grand Guignol stayed true to its naturalistic roots by depicting human-on-human -human violence and derangement. Maori hired the playwright Andre Delord for most of the Guignol's material, who in turn collaborated with his therapist, a man named Alfred Binet. If that name is familiar to you, it's because he also invented the IQ test. Together, Maori and Delord depicted psychosis, hypnosis, panic, fugue states, and a multitude of other psychological conditions never before staged, at least as such. In 1914, the Grand Guignol goes to director Camille Choisy, who continues in Maori's mold. And in 1917, Choisy hires the Grand Guignol's greatest heroine, Paula Maxa, born Marie Therese Beau in 1898, the same year that the Guignol first started doing horror. In her autobiography, Maxa speaks of having a loving mother who tutored her and provided piano lessons, but admits to also having an early childhood fascination with death and gore. In her teens, Maxa's first boyfriend attempted to murder her, a trauma that she embraced and would later channel through her work. She was also an early fangirl of the Grand Guignol, and her life took an almost completely different turn when at 16, she married a French count. Thankfully for us and for the genre of horror, she left him in order to pursue her acting career and become the muse par excellence of the Grand Guignol. In her career there, Full-time until the late 1920s, with frequent guest appearances all the way into the 30s, she earns the title of the most assassinated woman in the world. She is estimated to have died over 30,000 times on the stage of La Grande Guignol, in every way from normal eviscerations, gunshots, and blunt force traumas, to exotic fashions like death by steamroller or being eaten alive by a puma. 200 nights in a row, she simply decomposed on stage in front of an audience which wouldn't have exchanged its seats for all the gold in the Americas. And in terms of psychological torment, she is said to have simulated over 3,000 sexual assaults. Now, for Maxa, this was a virtuosic vic victimhood, a, an expression of her agency and not a betrayal of it. Keep in mind, the Guignol was also an equal opportunity murderer. Both men and women played villains and victims with near equal rates. Now, the Grand Guignol showed five to six plays a night, interspersing a few broady comedies in between what they called for a hot shower, cold shower effect. Uh, and these were not film scenes that could be done once and then repeated endlessly. Maxa was putting her body through these extreme displays four times a night, tous les soirs, that means every night, 
for years. Maxa finally retired from Le Grand Guignol in 1933, partly due to disputes with the theater's new management and partly because her voice had given out from all the screaming. She became the director of the neighboring Theater of Vice and Virtue and in later years wrote her autobiography, Maxa. In 2018, she was depicted as the protagonist of the French murder mystery, appropriately titled, The Most Assassinated Woman in the World. As for the Guignol, Though it lingered into the 60s, its heyday was undone by the onset of World War II. As the theater's last director, Charles Nonon, says, we could never equal Buchenwald. Before the war, everyone felt what was happening on stage was impossible. Now we know that these things, and worse, are real. Happy 2020, everybody. So please join me in raising a glass to Paula Maxa, to the Grand Guignol, and to the wish that our imagination for horror always exceed what the world can show us. Thank you, everyone.